to image the brain, but there are various fundamental reasons why I think that's going to be tricky. So I've been focusing very much on slice and scan uh, technology, which gives most people the creep, because nobody will really wants to have a brain uh, cut into small, small pieces and scan by somebody. After all, what happens if we miss a few of these puzzle pieces? Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, the technological infrastructure surrounding the scanning right now is a very interesting kind of test bed. We have various technologies, and a lot of them actually get the right resolution, but have various interesting drawbacks. But the microscopy people are awfully clever. They're overcoming this uh, in a lot of ways. So my friend Todd Huffman, uh, uh, he's been working, he's actually, I'm kind of doing a little advert now for his company, I hope you don't mind. Freescan, it's brand new, I think it actually came uh, online formally this week. Uh, so they had taken over what's called the knife edge scanning uh, microscope. So you have a diamond knife slicing off thin uh, pieces of uh, tissue, and it has uh, an objective that's essentially like a linear scanner, the usual kind of flatbed scan, but it does a scanning of the tissue as it's passing through. So this is go passing through a piece of brain tissue, then you get data, and then you get a block where you can do reconstruction. So if there was anything I want to show you, is this wonderful little thing. These are Purkinje cells from the cerebellum of mouse. So these are individual uh, nerve cells. And you can see the cell body and the parts of a dendritic tree, where they almost look like corals. And then you can, of course, rotate and play around with them. And you can scale up a larger region of interest. So you can see how these cells are organized next to each other. You can see that they're kind of aligned. So it's, uh, they're all forming lines. And between them, which you can't see in this kind of picture, there's a lot of fibers running through them, connecting to them, and uh, sending information that they receive. And under this layer of Purkinje cell, there is another layer which is more muddy here. That's called the granular layer. The interesting thing about this little data set is that we actually got a data set at this resolution of the entire mouse brain. Two terabytes. It takes a few hours to run, but uh, Todd is planning to essentially give away hard drives with uh, this data set to uh, in any interested researchers to get them to you know, want to use this technology, because that's of course going to be good for his company. Yeah? How do they prepare the brain? Uh, it, uh, first you perfuse it with various uh, nasty chemicals that fixate everything in place. Uh, essentially you put it into plastic. So uh, you have uh, in this, uh, you might see this little uh, yellowish thing here, that's essentially resin keeping it in place. So the micro, so they have to make it very hard. So this is doing awful things on the chemical level to the brain. So this is just getting structure, which is a bit sad. So before you get killed by having your brain sliced, you get killed by having your brain frozen? Something like that. And then, of course, dunked in the alcohol yes. and uh, various other chemicals. Do that anyway. Does it yeah. uh, do too much damage to it before you can get a scan? Uh, in this case, uh, it seems that, well, they do, the, the, this is kind of standard histology preparation. So this is what neuroscientists use all the time. So it does certain kinds of damage, but uh, apparently they don't affect the structure too much. Uh, I think for the real kind of scans that actually uh, uh, we want to do and, uh, in the future, we need to develop much, much better methods than this. It, but the interesting thing, this is something we got right now. Todd is giving away his hard drives at this moment, uh, hopefully. Uh, and this is already interesting because uh, one of my colleagues at Oxford immediately perked up and wanted to know what's the actual structure of the hippocampus. Well, it turns out that the hippocampus, which is very well researched in the brain, uh, there is a kind of assumption about the lamella structure which everybody's making because if it's not true it would be embarrassingly messy. But we don't quite know whether that's true because nobody has actually done this kind of large scale. It would be pretty easy for Todd just to look into his data set uh, if he knew about this question, which I'm of course going to mail him as soon as I get the chance, just to check for this. Yeah. So I'm almost certainly out of date, but about 15-20 um, years ago there was a simulation of aplysia, you know, the flatworm, and it was, yeah. I think it was complaints that the uh, even though we had a precise structural information, that we didn't get the functional, yeah. functional prediction. Uh, and, and the reason is that it's actually the C. elegans uh, network. We know perfectly oh, well right. which neurons there are and their connectivity. Mm. And uh, the embarrassing thing is we don't know what strength there are on the synaptic connections right. or even their sign. And their sign is really important because inhibitor and excitatory yeah. signs are completely different. Cool. So we need a better way of doing that scanning. So this is something we have been looking into the roadmap, and the Randall has some ambitious ideas about how to actually not just uh, do this, but also about how to do the testing. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that normally doesn't get done. Uh, essentially, he's trying to take, get some of the software engineering ideas about uh, setting in, adding testing to the process of developing software, to do adding testing to the development of these kind of models. 
in any case, uh, I, I, I can go on forever about this, as you probably can guess, but I guess I should go through and just you know, sum up a bit on the interesting conclusions here. But afterwards, I'm happy to get into all the things about Goethe, Alder, Hyde, and fixation and the other stuff. I just want to well uh, mention array tomography, which is a really cool other method where we actually you can first stain for various chemicals, but you get them at a fairly low resolution using an optical microscope. But you can figure out essentially any chemical you know about, you can figure out where it's located in the tissue slices. And afterwards, you can scan at high resolution, which mangles the slice, but that way you can get the 3D structure. So, this way, you can get exactly which cells exist and a pretty good idea of what chemicals are in them. And that's exactly what we would like it to get to actually do a complete um, PCR simulation. Then, of course, we need software to do this interpretation, uh, which uh, people are starting to work on. But as soon as these enormous data sets are coming, it's very likely that people are going to be much more interested in giving this to the, uh, the grad students to actually solve. Because right now, this is largely done by hand. And, uh, well, the grad students are relatively cheap, but for two terabytes, you need an awful lot of uh, grad <laughs> students to actually uh, do the work. Especially since we're going to talk about m much more data when you uh, get it at high resolution. So right now we have some simple algorithms that can track. This is blood vessels uh, in our brain, for example, so it's not even neurons. But this only works to some extent, because occasionally you get noise. You want to have a very high probability to get everything right, or a way of afterwards debugging it. And that's something people need to uh, solve. And then we have the simulations where we're actually doing pretty well. We have a, this is for example a typical model of a proteinia cell as we're using the simulation. So basically composed of small compartments that uh, turn out to be cylinders or spheres. Uh, this might be the right resolution. It might turn out that we need to use a higher resolution or that neurons actually can be simplified. We don't know that yet. But again, this comes back into the testing. So overall, then we need the body models, of course, and then you can start thinking about, well, when will you have at least the computing power to do this? And it turned out that computing power, although we can't always uh, rely on Moore's law being nice, I think this graph is rather fun because it shows that before 1940 it was horizontal. And we should remember that, well, maybe it's going to turn on a dime again sometime and then turn horizontal. We can't just rely on it always going forward. Could it go to a Yeah. Might be. Uh, I, I would be surprised. And maybe the quantum stuff is going to help it turn uh, imaginary or something. Um, but, but the further we go into the future, the less likely it is that it's going to stay on the, this nice slope. And that's simply something we have to live with. Um, so I've been trying, depending on what level you want, uh, this is supercomputer speed, which is behaving very nicely. So one way of doing this is kind of use more slow and look at how much computing power are we going to get at different points in the future. And depending on our assumption of how much we need to simulate to the brain, so this would be the kind of simplest possible models, and up here you have a single molecule simulation, we can look at, well, at what point would we at first have enough, com at least computing power? Of course, it might turn out that we need to simulate it somewhere up here. So that would put us something in the 2040s. But, of course, it could turn out we neuroscientists are not doing our job. We're not figuring things out, so it might be much further away from that, because we can't figure out the hard part. Uh, but the interesting thing is we can at least make some uh, educated guesses and even update them as we get more information. So we can, for example, sketch in a bit of uh, what we think about the scanning technology and get some rough estimates of how far away this is. And I think that is useful because it might also tell us about how urgent is this compared to having uh, various forms of uh, other artificial intelligence. Uh, simply so what were the dates that you were highlighting as uh potentially being able to do this full brain emulation for a human? My guess, and this is just a guess, and uh, I'm constantly getting misquoted on this, but I don't mind that, uh, is that we're somewhere on this level. So I think around the 2040s, uh, we should expect for that for a few million dollars, you could do at least the computing. Uh, notice one interesting if we imagine uh, if we throw a lot of my extra money, a billion dollars, when we can probably do this about uh, between 20 and 10, uh, 10 years earlier. And smaller brains can be done earlier. So the interesting thing is the step from mouse to human in less than 20 years. So once you've done the breakthrough and actually managed to simulate the mouse, we don't have that much of the time. 
but it's still enough time for society to react. My uh, nightmare scenario is that uh, one day uh, so, uh, we have already developed a lot of computing power. We have uh, more than enough. We have scanned a lot of brains, but none of the simulation ever worked. One day a bright grad student realized, oh, how could